Welcome to Contracting Conversation. My name is Scott Williams, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jim Valley. Today, we have the pleasure of having with us Professor Chris Merkel, who's a learning uh, asset manager for a course called BFM 2750B. It's a virtual course. The title is Industry Financial Business Acumen. And we thought that you guys may be very interested to listen to what Chris has to say about this course. Chris, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Scott and Jim, for having me. I appreciate that a ton. We're very happy to have you branching out today as we are into the business financial management area. So, Chris, tell us a little bit about your course. Well, the BFM 2750, right, is virtual. It's a three-day course, right, virtually. We normally do six hours a day. So just give you kind of a sense of how long. And what we do in 2750 is we take a look at from the government's point of view knowing because we know that there are there are different assets out there that help us to understand in in our career fields both fmers contractors everybody um from the from the industry point of view how do they do business so what 2750 does is kind of takes that knowledge that starting point and kind of turns it on its head and says, okay, we know how industry, you know, deals with things, what's their priorities, what they're looking at. Now, from us in the government side, how can we utilize our knowledge of how they deal with things to to our advantage, to be able to get the best acquisition outcome that we can? So some of the things that we deal with, because they're very, they're very, I don't want to say esoteric, but they're, they're not a normal for, for either a government finance person or frankly, from what I've seen, most of the government career fields. We look at things like different business entities, kinds of businesses, right? So are they sole proprietorships? Are they... S corps, C corps, are they partnerships? Are they joint ventures? And how does that impact a government program? We look at a company's financial condition, right? Which is how are they doing? We look at their at their historical, at their at their SEC filings, right? Their income statements or balance sheets. How are they currently doing? That's their financial condition. But we use that then to take the next step, which is to look at their financial capability, which is, okay, I'm on the government side. I have a contract that I expect to have a period of performance, let's say three years. What, what's the possibility that this potential offerer will wind up not being in business in three years? And that's what financial capability looks at is, What's the risk that maybe this company isn't going to be around? And unfortunately, in our current economic condition, particularly small to mid-sized companies, we're at an almost all-time high for bankruptcies, which, which impacts Department of Defense. Other things we look at, you know, we look at, we look at contract families, right? What do we get from them? But more than that, we look at the, the estimated prices at complete. Because from an FM standpoint, there is a a real concern there that makes sure that we have in place the amount of funds that are going to be required. We talk about um, time value of money. We talk about um, the benefits that accrues to industry, our industry partners, from the way that the government pays. You know, we pay in a timely fashion. Right, and there is there is a benefit to that from the industry perspective. So knowing that, we go okay from the government perspective. How can we utilize that piece of information to be able to get the best negotiate the best deal we can? Then we look at rates because um, the indirect rates are such a huge part of the total cost that government programs pay to the contractor. And so we 
we look at how those rates are developed. We look at, you know, the, some of the questions are, you know, what's an offsite rate? Just what is it? How is it developed? Why, why is it potentially a good thing for the government? You know, we explore the whole question that says, is there such a thing as a normal, and I'm using my fingers in air quotes, is there a normal indirect rate based on either an industry or a geographic location? And we explore those kinds of things. We look at distortions. How in the world is it that based on what a contractor chooses to use for their bases, uh, for their rates, how can that actually wind up costing the U.S. government and particularly Department of Defense more money than we would have if the company had chosen a different base? And then finally, we take a look at, because even of the rates, we have to be very, very cognizant that the pools, right, the, 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 the costs, right, in those pools, those indirect costs are important, absolutely, but what really drives rates is the basis, is the business that the companies use when they build those rates, right? If that base goes up, the rates that we, the government, pay go down. If those bases go down, the rates that we pay as the government go up. And so there's all kinds of dynamics there based on contract type. And how do we know, you know, we're, we're midway through a year. How do I know that the contractor just got some kind of a giant contract that we didn't know, right? My program didn't know they were going to get. And what could be the potential implications cost-wise to my contract? At what point in time do I go back to the contractor and go, hey, wait a minute, you guys, you guys got this great big contract. The rates I'm paying should be going down. Let's talk. So those are just some of the kinds of things that we that we explore a little more in depth in BFM 2750. Hey, great, Chris. Uh, thanks. It was that's pretty sounds like a pretty interesting course. Um, and thank you for running through it. Absolutely, my pleasure. I, I would argue not only I think it's interesting, right? Because I have experienced both working government acquisition, but also I have experience in the industry side. And I will tell you is not only is it interesting, but you'd be fascinated the that knowing knowing some of this information, how it can really, really benefit a government program uh, to be able to know some of the think of it kind of the the behind the scenes of what's going on with some of these topics. All right. Hey, Chris, this is awesome. The reason why we brought you on, because, you know, this is BFM, this is not a con course, is we wanted people to see other areas, other functionals where, hey, maybe a good idea for contracting professionals to take something like this, because I think it would very much benefit them in responsibility determinations, also know what the health of their company is and see if there's any issues. And so what I want to hear from you is what your thoughts are on that and in the, in the target audience and how contracting would benefit from your standpoint. Sure. Well, okay. So let's look at two of the topic areas that we cover, right? So some of the topic areas, you know, my, your contracting professionals are going to go, well, we already know contract types. Agreed, right? But do you really understand what, from a financial perspective, we as government finance professionals are allowed to budget for, right? And so that's kind of interesting. But you make a great point, Jim, in this whole idea of financial responsibility. So one of the things that we do in um, 2750 is we teach the students how to use what is called multi-discriminant analysis, MDA. And it's super simple. It uses just some of the information from a publicly traded company's income or balance sheet. Or if they're not publicly traded, we actually talk about, well, how in the world could an analyst get this kind of information? And 
it's using this MDA, this multidiscriminant analysis, it's a super quick, what do we think the chances are of this company going bankrupt? And it's one of the things that DCMA, the financial uh, responsibility folks would look at, but I don't know why they have gotten away from it. And the other drawback is so often what happens is when we're doing financial responsibility looks, we're looking at a very short term, right? Oh, will they be around? Do they have enough cash flow to be around in a year? Do they, you know, I'm not really worried about that. My bigger concern for my government program is, are they, are they going to be around in the three to five years that this contract is going to be around? If it's a bigger contract, right, with multiple years, we're going to be buying this, whatever it is, for 10, 12 years, right? Now it becomes even more important. The other one is that I would, I would argue that understanding the base implications is super important for particularly contracting folks to understand, right? When we're, when we're doing nego price negotiations on a contract, because those rates are so important, and I know, right, we have, we have DCMA. And I have heard people say, well, but DCMA does the, does the rate stuff, right? They do, they use the rate cycle and, you know, forward pricing rate proposals, negotiate them, coming up with agreements, got it. But here becomes the question. How many people have no kidding gone back to the, the DCMA DACOs and actually asked them going, hey, so just out of curiosity, have you done any analysis on how much fixed versus variable cost is in the pool? My hope is they go, oh, no, no, we're, we're all over it. But my fear is that that DACO CACO is going to come back and go, why? And you're going to find out in 2750 that because the the proportion of fixed cost in the pool for an indirect rate can have significant, I'm going to say huge, because it really truly is huge, impact on what happens to the rates, right? We talked, you know, even here that, oh, the base goes down, so that means that the rate is going up. Yes, but if in the pool there are more fixed costs, yes, the rate's going to go up, and it's going to go up huge. It's going to go up significantly. Now, if I'm if I'm a contracting person, you know, right? If I'm an FMer, isn't this something that I would like to be ahead of, as opposed to being surprised by after it happens? So that's that's why I would argue that there is a lot of of really good information that my contracting brethren could take away from this class. And so thank you, Chris. So I would assume that by taking this course, they are able to absorb what their financial person is telling them, right? Because they can then understand, okay, these are the type of documents. I can then have a conversation with my financial functional expert and be able to understand what they're saying and also be able to ask the, the right questions. Wouldn't you say? I think, Jim, that that's key right there right? It's all about conversations. Now, the question becomes, is it conversations with um, my financial, right? With my, my business finance management people in my program? Is it, is it conversations with my industry partners? And this class is designed to fill anybody with the background and the knowledge to be able to ask better questions. And if we can ask better questions, what that means is we can get to a to a better understanding of the situation that, that's that's at hand, whether that be with our finance folks inside the program or even with our industry partners. Yeah, that's outstanding. Thanks, Chris.
Hey, Chris, I just have a, a quick follow up uh, before we wrap up today. But uh, I understand that ACK 315 is a prerequisite for your class. So we'll just hit that really quickly. And as Jim addressed, uh, your course, I think, would be a great one for contracting people. But let's just talk a little bit about the prerequisite and also just how they're assessed in BFM 2750. Okay, so the prereq, the Act 315, right? What that course does is it puts the student, it, it's like, yeah, you just got hired by this, this industry company, right? So you're in what we call the C-suite, the corporate suites making the, the decisions. And that course gives the student the opportunity to view how industry companies make decisions right how do they decide yes we're going to bid on this contract or this this opportunity no we're going to let this one go how do they decide well we really need to have a return on investment of you fill in blank here right and so what what 315 does is it it puts the student in in the company to show them how how companies make those those kinds of decisions. And then what we do in 2750 is we go, okay, super. Now that you know how the company does that, now let's let's go and take a little deeper look from the from the government program office side. How can we utilize that information? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thanks, Chris. So we're going to close the show, but before we do that, is there anything else you want to add? Yeah, as a matter of fact, okay. Something that everybody, regardless of career field, needs to understand is that within Department of Defense, business acumen is rapidly becoming like this new buzzword, buzz, you know, this, this new phrase. And so there is a big push regardless of your your career field to get what what we're calling business acumen. Now we haven't really decided what in the world that is because that could be a very broad term. But I would argue that at its core understanding the industry how they make their decisions and whether we like it or not when we talk industry, it's all about money, right? It's about making a making a profit, a fair profit, but that's what we on the government side need to understand is their driver and their motivator. So once we learn that, um, it will help us, but every career field is gonna have to learn that. And I think that cross, I'll call it cross-pollination, if you will, between career fields just makes sense. Knowing the more we know, the better we can help our programs do at making good acquisition outcomes. All right, outstanding, Chris. So thank you so much for coming onto the show today. Oh, I've loved this. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we are glad to have you. So for all of you out there, this is the end of our podcast. Hopefully we'll have Chris back again on another podcast. For those of you out there, you can see contracting conversations in several different locations. One is DAU Media, which you may be on right now, but also Apple Podcasts and YouTube. So please go into those sites, subscribe to them, and also like the video if you do like it. That does help the algorithms out there. And we look forward to having future contracting conversations with you.